Okay, so last week we did do David the Sheep. And David the Sheep, it was part one. So today we're going to be doing David the Sheep part two. And today the main point to take away is talk to your shepherd. Talk to your shepherd. All right, we went through the first six parts of the 23rd Psalm last week. The first six parts where it said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And what you'll notice is the pronoun he. He does this. He does this. It's like David is talking to someone about his shepherd, okay? But then you'll notice that the pronouns change in the next six. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over and surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in your house, O Lord, forever. So now he is talking to, not talking about, but talking to. Both are important. We should be talking about our shepherd and we should be talking to our shepherd. Both are important. So that's basically repeating this. In addition to testifying about the good shepherd, the sheep is now talking to the good shepherd. Now, as we're going to see, <clears throat> and we're covering, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, it says during the summer, the shepherd moves his flock from the home range to mountain ranges for better grazing. As the sheep move from their place of safety into valleys where the threat of death is much greater, the importance of the shepherd becomes much greater in terms of leading them to higher ground. Because you know sheep, they can get lost very easily, get distracted very easily. Now, if they're in a nice place where there's already still waters, where there are already green pastures, they can wander around, it's already fenced in, I mean, and they can live a decent life. But if they're going through a place that's somewhat dangerous, they need the shepherd all the more. So what is this dangerous place? It says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Let's break that down a little bit. You know, we say that we have to dominate our dominion. That's another series of messages that I gave, probably about 12 in that series, if not 16. But dominating our dominion, and the acronym is T. T for thoughts, E for emotions, and A for actions. And that's the way we should operate. Not actions first, not emotions first. Our thoughts should control our emotions and our actions. So notice how he says, for you are with me. That's his thought. You are with me. That is the thought. That's controlling everything else. Backing up, he says, I will fear no evil. That is controlling his emotions. I will fear no evil because you are with me. And then, of course, we have, if you've got your thoughts and your um, emotion, then you have your action. Now look at the action. I'm walking. That is the action, as I'm actually walking. And because he says, and last week you all had mentioned one of the keys that was repeated over and over again to him going through this successful journey, is he says, as we talked about knowing. So you got to know, you got to be secure, et cetera, et cetera. So he says, you are with me. He knows that his good shepherd is with him. He knows that his good shepherd knows this pathway that they've been walking through year after year after year. He knows that his shepherd is going to beat up and, and defeat and even kill 
all of the enemies. He knows that he's going to get to his proper destination. So because he knows that, it gives him this assurance. And he says, I will fear no evil. But we do have to say he's acting and he's walking. Now, where is he walking? He's walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Now, we're going to look at the life of Job to help us to explain what the shadow of death is and what might be happening and show you the mistake that Dave, that uh, Job made, contrast it with the attitude that David has. OK, so that's what we're going to be looking at uh, in this first part. And we're going to spend quite a bit of time on this first part. Then we'll speed up for the rest, because really, this is the crux of it. Knowing who God is, that's the thought. You are with me. That controls our emotion. I will fear no evil, so I don't have anxiety. Though I'm going through something, I'm walking. My action is I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death. And let me ask you this other question before we even go on from there. Has the shadow of a sword ever killed anybody? No. No unless they panicked and had a heart attack just from seeing the shadow. But the shadow of a sword doesn't kill anybody. Does the shadow of a car or a truck, has that ever killed anybody? No, unless again, you panic because you think something's gonna happen. So he's saying he's going through the valley of the shadow of death. He understands there's not death there for him. It's just the shadow of death, but he understands it's not going to kill me going through this valley because God is with me. Thou art with me. So it's just a shadow. Now, yeah, there might be a dead um, lamb, a dead sheep hanging in a tree somewhere or a dead lamb that's on the ledge of a rock. And because of the sun, there's a shadow, but that's because it's a different shepherd that was leading them. And that shepherd couldn't keep his sheep alive. But this shepherd says, we're going through a journey and I'm going to keep you alive. So keep that in mind. We're on a journey. And now let's look, let's trace the life of Job. Job went through the valley and eventually he reached the mountaintop. So just real brevity, you remember that Elohim, and this is so important, for us to remember as well. Elohim is the one who led Job into the valley. Is that correct? Okay. What, how do we know that's correct? What, what happened? What's the conversation? He asked him if he considered his servant Job. Exactly. He, Elohim asked Satan, have you considered my servant Job? So we know that Elohim is the one who led Job into the valley. And then Satan attacked Job, and you can see the chapter and the verse where that happened if you want to read it and really kind of break it down. So Satan attacked Job, and then Mrs. Job attacked Job. And if you also remember in the story, the first thing that happened when Satan attacked Job, Job said, blessed is the name of the Lord he gives and takes away. So he actually blessed God with his mouth. Then when his wife attacked him, it says he spoke no evil with his mouth. It doesn't say that he blessed God. It doesn't say that he cursed God. It just says that he didn't say anything. So we're seeing a progression. He starts out and it's hard when Satan attacked him. Blessed be the name of Job because he said, blessed be the name of God. So whenever we have trials, it is a great thing to initially say, blessed be the name of God. As the trial goes on, the question is, how do we react? Do we then start to say, well, I'm just going to be quiet? Or do we still praise God? And then as the trial gets even worse, it's prolonged, it gets even deeper. What is our reaction? Well, worship while you wait. That's what we should be doing. <laughs> That's what we should be doing. <laughs> That's more like it. Let's get this over. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So let's Job chapter three, verse 11, one through 11. And I'm going to abbreviate some of this. This is Job chapter three, verses one through 11. So this is after Mrs. Job attacked him. And he just said, woman, you're foolish. Just shut up. And he 
um, hadn't cursed God at that point. He just shut his mouth. But after he had a while to scrape some of the sores off of him and think about, man, I'm getting hit and realize he doesn't know what's going on in heaven. He doesn't realize what's going on. That is important because we said David knows his shepherd. We should know our shepherd. At this point, Job did not know his shepherd. Okay. So it says, after this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. What does it mean to curse the day of birth? Verse two, Job answered, let the day perish in which I was born and the night which said there is a boy conceived. So both the day and the night comprising a full day. Let darkness and the shadow of death claim it for their own. And if you do a search on this term, shadow of death, Job uses it, I think, about 12 times, and it's only used 15 times in the Bible. So Job uses it the most because he's going through a lot. So let darkness and the shadow of death claim it for their own. Let the stars of its twilight, this is verse 9 now, that was verse 5. We just read verse 9. Let the stars of its twilight be dark. Let it look for light, but have none, neither let it see the eyelids of the morning. That's what he's saying. This is how he's cursing the day of his birth, wishing that he was never born. It says, because it didn't shut up the doors of my mother's womb, nor did it hide trouble from my eyes. Verse 11, why didn't I die in the womb? Why didn't I give up the spirit when my mother gave birth to me? That's some serious cursing of the day. So he was going through this valley of the shadow of death. And for Job, he's thinking, it's better for it not to be a shadow, but for it to be the real thing. Because I just want this to stop, as Brother Tim said. I just want this to stop. Now, we don't see him cursing God yet. He's cursing the day of his birth. But that's coming. So Job's three friends attack Job. You can read that in chapters 4 through 31. And now we're going to just go back for a second. In the midst of Job's three friends attacking Job, let's go to chapter 10. And this is, if you want to read the entire thing, verses 1 through 22. Uh, yeah, that's I'm sure how he sounded. <laughs> so Job chapter 10 and verse 1, my soul is weary of my life. I will give free course to my complaint. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. I will tell Elohim, don't condemn me. Show me why you are contending with me. This is like a boxing match. You are the heavyweight champion, unified. You've never lost. And you're picking on me a flyweight. Now, a flyweight, I think, is about 100 and 2,430 pounds. A heavyweight these days is probably 234 pounds. And plus that, usually the bigger people, they have a longer arm reach, maybe 84 inches. And the flyweights, they might have 60 inches. So it's like, how can you get inside? They're taller to heavyweights. The light flyweights are shorter. How can you even get close to him to hit him in the first place, much less knock him out? So it's like, Show me why you contend with me. Verse three, is it good to you that you should oppress, that you should despise the work of your hands and smile on the counsel of the wicked? God, you've got things backwards. I look around and I see evil people like Vladimir Putin, who's still alive. And yet you see kids in Rob Elementary who got slaughtered. That makes no sense, God. And that's what you're doing to me. I'm like one of these little kids. I've been righteous all of my life. And I'm looking around, I'm seeing all these evil people. What are you doing picking on me when you should be picking on them? Go out and destroy them. Leave me alone, is basically what Job is saying. And that's because he doesn't know who his shepherd is. So he's walking through this valley of the shadow of death, thinking that it's going to lead to death because he doesn't know. His he doesn't know that his shepherd will defeat every enemy and lead him 
uh, to higher ground. So Job did question God. He complained to God. Here's where most people misunderstand the book of Job. And so thank you for asking that question. God clearly said, Job is righteous. No question about that. So Job did not have his problems because he sinned. That's not the question. Job was not being punished by God. So people understand that part. But then they can't make the transition to say, as Job was suffering, because Job didn't understand that he wasn't being punished by God and looked at it as being punishment from God, and unjustly so because he was righteous in his own eyes, that's why Job started to complain. And because people can't understand that, they get it wrong. So they're looking at the statement from God. God says he's righteous. That's a true statement. He did not enter into his trials because he had sinned. In fact, God sick Satan on him, knowing the end result that Job would not curse him and die. That's what his wife said, curse God and die. Now he started to curse God, but he didn't die. He didn't kill himself and just say, I'm finished with it. But he, he did curse God. He got upset with God. And, you know, we'll read a little bit more about this, but people can't understand and make the transition. It wasn't that Job entered the trial because of sin, but we do have to acknowledge that his suffering was prolonged because he entered into sin and God needed to correct him. So Job made some grave errors by talking about God in a very disrespectful manner and putting himself up above God and throughout the whole book. Yep, you got to read the whole book to capture it all. And uh, and God had to correct him, and he did. And we're going to see that. Yes. Thank you for saying that, because I've read Job, and I'm like, here he is, clearly. This guy is upset, you know? He's questioning God, you know? Yeah. So even if you try to look at it from the perspective that he was very humble, you know, Oh Lord, but still clearly here in the writing, even through his humbleness or whatever, he's questioning God. Yeah. You know, and then when you think about it, he's human. And when we put ourselves in that place, you know, we're gonna be the same way. We're not gonna be saying, oh Lord, you know, yeah. it's gonna be God, help me, help me. I mean, what is it? What am I doing? What have I done wrong? Right. You know, I mean, I've done everything, da 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 da. So I'm glad you said that because I've yeah. several times and tried to see the part where he didn't, and it's clearly there. Maybe he does. Yeah, he did. Now I I need to keep going just because we're recording this, and all of y'all have said keep your YouTube videos to an hour. So let's do the comments and questions at the end. <laughs> They're good, but let's keep them for the end. Keep those thoughts in mind. But just as flat out, people don't don't understand the Book of Job for some reason. They they miss it. And so continuing on um, in verse six, why do you inquire after my iniquity and search after my sin? Although you know that I am not wicked, there is no one who can deliver out of your hand. If I sin, then you mark me. You will not acquit me from my iniquity. If I'm wicked, woe to me. If I'm righteous, I still shall not lift up my head, being filled with disgrace and conscious of my affliction. Verse 16. If my head is hurt, if my head is held high, you hunt me like a lion. Now, who's the roaring lion that seeks to devour us? It's Satan, the devil. And he's actually beginning to accuse God Almighty of being in the place of Satan, the devil. I am righteous. And yet you are hunting me like a lion so you can devour me. So what good is it that I've been righteous all of the days of my life? And look at what's happening to me. That's basically what he's saying. You renew your witnesses against me. It's like my wife, then my three friends. You're just bringing up witness after witness to testify against me. And again, if you read the entire... Book of Job, you'll see more details about that. And it's like, we're on trial and I'm putting God on trial 
And I'm saying to the whole world, I am righteous. God is not because God is punishing me for something that I did not do. And that's the totally wrong understanding. God is actually saying, Job, you are righteous. And I know you can take this. And when God got finished with him, he did end up glorifying God. And we'll get to that. But Job wasn't understanding what was going on because he didn't know his shepherd. He hadn't talked to his shepherd enough to get to know him. So um, in verse 18, you have brought me out of the womb. Oh, why then? Why then have you brought me out of the womb? I wish I had given up the spirit and no eye had seen me. Aren't my days few? Leave me alone that I may find a little comfort before I go where I shall not return from to the land of darkness and of the shadow of death. The land dark as midnight of the shadow of death without any order where the light is at midnight. Oh, that's supposed to be an arrow. You're hunting me like a lion. So that was an arrow being shot at Job. <laughs> <laughs> just to let you know all right so job chapter 16 verses 1 through 16 again we're going to abbreviate some of it job chapter 16 verses 1 through 16 and this is continuing as job's friends one after the other stand up as witnesses testifying against him and they were all saying this is one of the things that perverted job's mind again read through the story they're all saying job listen the only time Christians suffer is when they do something wrong, which is totally false. We know that. But that's what they kept saying. You would not be in this situation if you were as righteous as you said. So therefore, you must have done something wrong because God is not ever going to bring trials upon his children. One after the other, they kept saying it and they kept taking turns. And so Job was like, man, get out of my face. And so Job said to his friends, you are all miserable comforters. What are you doing here? Get out of my face. All you do is bring more misery. You don't know what you're talking about. What provokes you to speak? I could speak as you do. If your souls were in my place, I could accuse you of all kinds of stuff. I could heap up words against you and shake my head at you. Uh, uh, uh. You sorry dude, you, you just can't see how evil you are. Look at all these bumps on you. Every one of these bumps represents a thousand one of your sins. That's basically what they were saying. Yeah, so verse seven. You've made all my company desolate and Elohim has made me weary. His anger has torn and hated me. He gnashes on me with his teeth. My enemy, he's calling God his enemy. My enemy sharpens his eyes at me. Elohim, verse 11, has turned me over to the wicked. In verse 12, I was at ease, but he has broken me in pieces. I was doing okay until God started to mess with me. Yes, he has also taken me by my neck and shaken me to pieces. And this is amazing. And again, set me up for his target. It's like, if you want to follow through an analogy, a lion grabbing a lamb, or maybe it's the baby, maybe it's a baby lion, and the mother is trying to teach the lion, the baby lion, how to uh, hunt. So the mother lion grabs the lamb, but doesn't really kill it, but just shakes it some, and then sets it up for the baby lion to come in and actually attack the lamb to teach the lion how to hunt. And that's basically what Job is saying is you set me up for your target, God. That's what he's saying. You taking me by the neck, you shaking me to pieces like I'm a little rag doll and you set me up for your target like you're about to shoot arrows or you set me up for a target where your baby lions can come in and eat me up. But going back to analogy, verse 13, his archers, so more of the arrow, his archers hem me in. He splits my inward parts and does not spare. He pours out my gall on the ground. He breaks me with break on break. He runs on me like a giant. Again, you can just imagine all of this. It's like a big old bully 
let's go back to the boxing match. Big old heavyweight champion, never lost. Like you go back to Iron Mike Tyson fighting a small person. And it's like, I'm punching him, punching him. Referee, why don't you come in? Stop the fight. Cornerman, stop the fight. Please stop the fight. He's being massacred. Stop the fight. And Mike Tyson, with all of his power, is just hitting this little dude who's up against the ropes. His hand is down. He's basically already knocked out. He falls to the ground. The ref still doesn't stop him. And you know Mike Tyson back in his day when he bit Holyfield's ear. <laughs> Mike Tyson would then kick him and stop on him on top of everything else. That's what Job is saying about God. This is quite a revelation if you haven't really read it and sunk your teeth into it. In verse 15, I have sold sackcloth on my skin and thrust my horn in the dust. My face is reddened from weeping and on my eyelids is the shadow of death. I just know that death is coming. That's basically what he's saying. I know that death is coming. All right, so now, actually, that was the wrong thing. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. You'll get to hear that again. Okay, so we're still in the midst of Job's three friends attacking Job. And now let's read chapter 16, verses 1 through 16. Chapter 16, 1 through 16. Oh, that's what I just read. Okay, so forget that. We just read that. All right, so now Elihu, though, comes and he defends Elohim. That's in chapters 32 through 37. Elihu is a fourth person that comes up, but he defends Elohim. He knows his shepherd and he knows what's going on. Okay. So let's read chapter 34, verses 1 through 10. This is chapter 34, verses 1 through 10. That's the wind effect because he's blowing away his three friends. That's what that's supposed to represent. So Job chapter 34, verses 1 through 10. Elihu responded to Job and his three friends saying, hear my words, you who have wisdom. He's being sarcastic here. For Job has said, I am righteous and El has taken away my right. And El means the almighty one. So again, it's like Job is looking at God saying, he's the almighty one. I know he's God. I can't fight him. Why is he picking on me? But Job has said, I am righteous and El has taken away my right. Job is still speaking here. Ella, who, who was listening all that time is just recounting what Job is saying. So He's speaking Job's words in verse six. He's saying, should I lie against my right? In other words, I know that I'm right. If we had a court case, I'd stick to my guns. And I would say that God is wrong and I'm right. I'm not going to get up and lie just because, you know, God is bigger than me. I'm going to tell it like it is. My wound cannot be cured, though I'm without rebellion. Really? Now in verse seven, this is Elihu speaking. What man is like Job who drinks up scorning like water? Mm -hmm. He was scorning his good shepherd because he didn't know his good shepherd. But that's what he was doing. And you're drinking up scorn like water. It's like you're, you are not a, a wise person. You're a foolish person who goes in company with the workers of iniquity and walks with wicked men. Now, the difference between Elihu and the three friends, because the three friends were accusing Job of being wicked, and that's why he was being punished. But the difference is what we're about to see. For Job has said, it profits a man nothing when he is accepted by Elohim. So his three friends were saying, you sin, so therefore Elohim is punishing you. Elihu is saying, no, 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 get this right. God allows trials to happen to even his own children whom he loves dearly. So it does profit us. What does it say? The trying of your faith profits a lot because it makes us perfect if we just give it its time. So Job had it all wrong. And Elihu was able perceptively 
to see what the three friends missed. Now in verse 10, therefore, listen to me, far be it from Elohim to commit iniquity. And that's what Job had done. He had accused Elohim of committing iniquity and far be it from the Shaddai to do wrong. And the Shaddai is the one who pours forth blessings, right? And yet Job is looking and saying, I have curses poured out on me, as opposed to looking at his trial of faith being something that's good. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. That's the attitude that we as Christians need to have. But Job was missing that. Okay. Now, I probably missed something again. I might have been too smart for my own liking. So let's go back to this. <laughs> All right. So now Elohim defended Elohim. So Elohim comes to his own defense. And we know that what happened there. He spoke through a whirlwind. He talked about the Leviathan. He did all of these things. And after that, then he led Job to the mountaintop, which is where he was going to lead him all along. It's just that Job was thinking, I'm in this valley of the shadow of death, and this is where I'm going to die. He didn't understand that from the beginning, his good shepherd was leading him to the mountaintop. But he did. And you can read that in chapters 38 through 41. So that's a breakdown of the book of Job, if you ever want to look through it and really meditate on it. And now notice in Job chapter 42, hello, hello, Job chapter 42, verses 1 through 6. Look at Job chapter 42, verses 1 through 6. Job chapter 42, verses 1 through 6. Then Job answered Yahweh. Now, this is also interesting. Do a thorough study yourself on the book of Job. How many times do you think Job used the word Yahweh? as opposed to Elohim or even Elohah or some other name. How many times do you think Job spoke this? That would be a good guess, but double that, it's two times. The first time he said it was before he descended into his madness, where he said, the Lord gives, that's Yahweh. Yahweh gives, takes away, blessed be the name. But after that, after he descended, it was no more of this personal name because Yahweh is the personal name. Elohim is more of a title. It's like the family of God. Um, El is more of a title, the mighty one. Yahweh is the personal name, okay, of the one who appeared to Job, which we know was Yeshua. So again, after he goes through his trial, he's descended into madness, and then Elohim defended himself and caused Job to be enlightened, to say, wow, you are my shepherd, you are good, you meant all this for my good. Now he returns to the word Yahweh. Again, the question for us is, can we say Yahweh is good all of the time? Or do we say Yahweh is good when we have good times? Or Yahweh is good when we have a little trial, but then when we get into a bad trial, instead of Yahweh, now it's God, just a generic term. Or maybe we can say the Almighty One, but it's kind of distant. It's not that loving, personal relationship, which the word Yahweh denotes for us. That's the most intimate, personal word you can use in talking to this one who we know was uh, the word who appeared and spoke to people in the Tanakh, as we learned, is the better word for describing the law, the prophets, and the writings. All right, so he says, then Job answered, Yahweh, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be altered. You asked, who is this? This is what Yahweh asked of Job. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered that which I didn't understand. All of you who were here last week agreed that the number one thing for success in going through the journey and getting to the point where we say we're going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever is knowing who we are dealing with, knowing our good shepherd. That was the number one thing that all of us concluded. Is that correct? Everybody remember that. 
Job is saying and had said, therefore, I have uttered things which I didn't understand. He did not understand Yahweh as his good shepherd all of the time, and that Yahweh allows even his own children, whom he loves dearly, to suffer, but it's always for a definite purpose to bring us to higher ground. So we are never going through the valley of the shadow of death and believing that we're going to die in that valley. We always know that we are going through the valley of the shadow of death. And because we know who we're dealing with, thou art with me, we will fear no evil. Yep. So he says, therefore, I've uttered things which I didn't understand, things too wonderful for me, which I didn't know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you will answer. And Job had no answers. Now, here's, again, his new testimony. This is like, okay, that first trial is over. I lost it. The retrial happened after I gained some sense. Here's my new testimony. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I am righteous and you are unrighteous. Is he still saying that nonsense? No. no. Now he's saying, therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. So Job had a real transformation. And thankfully he did. Okay, so <clears throat> we can see that Job didn't know about the mountain. We can be on a mountaintop, but we can get into a valley, but we're not going to stop there because God's going to bring us back to the mountain. And so because he didn't understand that process, he complained. Now, I have also something, which if I can get this to stay here. And this is a test for me to see if this uh, eye surgery that I had works. Uh -huh. This is Job chapter 32, verses 1 through 3. Job chapter 32, verses 1 through 3. Job's three friends ceased to answer him because he was righteous in his own eyes. Then verse 2. Then the wrath of Elihu was kindled against Job because he justified himself rather than Elohim. Also, his wrath was kindled against Job's three friends. And if you go on to read, the reason why is because the Job's three friends accused him of suffering because he was doing wrong, and they couldn't point out any wrong that he had done. Okay? So if there's any question about Job, tell people to read, in particular, this verse right here, chapter 32, verses 1 through 3 where Elihu, the righteous one, says, and then verse 2, then the wrath of Elihu was kindled against Job because he justified himself rather than Elohim. So yes, Job was righteous at the beginning, but then he became self-righteous, because self-righteous means you make yourself righteous. You don't have the righteousness of God anymore which is imputed to us, we can't earn it. Job was like, yeah, I earn my righteousness because I pray every day, I give offerings every day. If my children do something wrong, I correct them, blah, blah, blah. That's how come I'm righteous. Well, all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. Only God can make us righteous, and that's by faith, and we have to accept that. So he complained. <clears throat> and I'm not. this is going to be very brief here. Israel knew about the mountain to valley to mountain promise. Now, I'll just tell you what this is about. Their mountain was, we are getting out of Egypt. They were on the mountaintop. We are getting out of Egypt after about 215 years, maybe actually less, about 200 years of being in Egyptian captivity slavery. All right. It wasn't 400 years, it wasn't 430 years. That's also something totally wrong that people miss. It was only about at most 200 years, probably more like 180 years actually being in captivity. So anyway, they were on the mountaintop. We are getting out of Egypt. What was their valley? The desert. 
we have to go through the valley of the shadow of death. But what was their other mountaintop? The promised land. So why, if they understood, and they did understood, they did know. They did understand, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> they did understood. That's my Ebonics. <laughs> no, they did understand. They knew about this because God told them, I'm bringing you out of Egypt to bring you into the promised land. So what's the problem? Well, again, they didn't have faith. They didn't have that personal relationship with their good shepherd. So they complained. Now, can we prove that? Of course, there's lots of verses that can prove that. But a synopsis is here, which is another excellent one. Jeremiah chapter 26 and verses 6 through 7. Or is that Jeremiah 2? That's Jeremiah 2. Sorry. Jeremiah 2 verses 6 through 7. Jeremiah chapter 2 verses 6 through 7. The Israelites did not say, where is Yahweh who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, who led us through the wilderness, through the land of drought and the shadow of death? I brought you into a plentiful land, but you defiled it. All throughout their journey, they complained. And even when they got to the mountaintop, into the promised land, they complained. They knew the journey beforehand, but they complained while they were going through the journey. Even after the journey was successful, they complained. Now, I can't imagine any of us, because it's not going to happen. But just think about this. We go from the mountain, which is, I got baptized I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. Life is going to be great. And then trials start to happen. Just the trials of life start to happen as a Christian. That's us going through the wilderness, through our valley of the shadow of death. God brings us into the promised land. We are resurrected in the first resurrection. Well, thank be to God <laughs> that when we're resurrected, there won't be any more Lucifer turned Satans in God's family. We will be perfect forever. But can you imagine God has told us where he's bringing us to. He's bringing us into eternal life to dwell with him forever and ever and ever. So why, even with the most severe trials, one after the other, would we ever complain? He has shown us that he loves us. So basically, just shut up. <laughs> Or if you open up your mouth, open it up in praise. Okay. So Job didn't know about the mountain to valley to mountain process, and he complained. Israel did know about the mountain to valley to mountain promise, and they still complained. David knew about the mountain to valley mountain promise, and he worshiped. And that is the difference. And that is the spirit we need to have, just like David. And if David is a man after God's own heart, then we should be people after God's own heart as well. Okay? All right, so now we're going to speed it up, though. <clears throat> if I can follow my <laughs> All right, so thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And again, he's talking to his Elohim, and he's saying, Listen, I know you. I know you as Yahweh, as my personal good shepherd. You are the Alpha, the Omega. You are the first. You are the last. You are the author and finisher of the faith. You've been there at the beginning. You're going to be at there at the end. You're the pioneer and captain of my salvation. You've gone through this road and led plenty of sheep to there. There's a whole cloud of witnesses that we have. You know what you're doing. And that's as we're going through life, keep talking to Yahweh and rehearse these things in your mind when you're going through trials. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. So the rod of God is used for protection and correction. We see that in Isaiah chapter 10, verses 24 through 27. Isaiah chapter 10, verses 24 through 27. It says, Yahweh of armies says, my people, don't be afraid of the Syrians, though he strike you with a rod. In a little while, my anger, 
My anger will be directed to destruction. Yahweh of armies will lift up his rod over the sea like he did against Egypt. His yoke shall be broken off of you. So sometimes that's the rod for protection. He's going to defeat. Don't be afraid of the rod of the Assyrians because God has a rod and his rod is bigger than their rod. But now it's for correction. Proverbs 13, verse 24. Proverbs 13, 24. He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him diligently disciplines him. I got plenty of spankings or butt whoopings. Mm -hmm. Now, thank be to God, I turned out okay because I was definitely on the wrong path. But um, God had something to work with, at least because my parents did correct me. And then verse 22 through 15, foolishness, Proverbs 22, verse 15, Proverbs 22, verse 15. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. Liam, Miles, <laughs> foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. Amon, yeah. foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. Anybody under 18 years old, 18 or under, is still considered a child. But a rod of discipline will drive foolishness far from him. So who's got the rod? We're going to have some whippings in here today. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> we don't believe in whipping anybody right in public. But we'll take you behind the door and do it <laughs> if you get out of and Liam's looking at me. Don't you dare try it. <laughs> Look, <laughs> and Miles is shaking right now. <laughs> no, we're just joking. But uh, spankings are okay. If y'all get a spanking, it's because your parents love you. And they just want to help correct you and lead you in the right way. All right. I'll hurt them when they hurt you. That's right. That's what they say. And children say, well, give me the belt and I'll spank you. <laughs> If that's the case. But anyway, Proverbs 29, verse 15. Proverbs 29, verse 15. A rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself disgraces his mother. So it says again, verse chapter 13, 24, that the rod is put on a child because of love. And verse 15 is going to drive foolishness from them if they get a spanking when they deserve it. And also it gives wisdom. So correction is a good thing. Now, the staff is used for support. So we said, thy rod and thy staff come for me. The rod is used for protection and correction. The staff is used for support. Zechariah chapter 8, verses 3 through 5. Zechariah chapter 8, verses 3 through 5. That's one of the last books in the Tanakh. So Zechariah chapter 8, verses 3 through 5. Yahweh says... I have returned to Zion, and I will dwell in the middle of Jerusalem. It shall be called the city of truth, and Zion shall be called the holy mountain. Old men and old women will again dwell in the streets of Jerusalem, every man with his staff in his hands. The streets of the city will be full of boys and girls playing in the streets. And that's a picture of the millennium. That did happen in part when they return to Jerusalem, but that's a prophecy of the future. So showing that every person is gonna be standing there, being able to stand on their staff, you can imagine the staff in their hand, and there is just a symbol of repose that I'm standing there. You see some people where they're standing, could even be where they're leaning on a car and they're just chilling. That's what it's talking about, leaning on something, not because they're old and decrepit, but leaning on something because they're comfortable. Judges chapter 6, Judges chapter 6, verses 19 through 24, Judges chapter 6, verses 19 through 24. And Gideon prepared a meal. The angel told Gideon, take the meal, lay it on this rock and pour out the broth. Yahweh's angel stretched out his staff and touched the food. Fire came out of the rock and consumed it. Gideon knew that he was Yahweh's angel and prayed saying, Yahweh, I've seen your angel face to face. And Yahweh said, peace be to you. You won't die. And Gideon built an altar and called it Yahweh is peace. So a staff is used for support. Okay. And it's supporting us in terms of the staff. He stretched it out, touched the food to bless it, um, make fire come out and show that, hey, 
you're going to be okay. I'm with you. I'm performing these miracles. All right. So now the next four sentiments, which ends uh, Psalm 23, the next four sentiments show power, purpose, provision, and praise. With the power is the statement, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. All right, all these enemies are around. They won't attack me. And God is saying, sit down. Don't worry about that. I got you. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Though a thousand or 10,000 fall by my side, I shall not be worried because I'm actually in my high tower of strength. Real quick story. Christian and I were on a safari in Kenya. And maybe this time it was Tanzania. And uh, so the safari leader told us, we need to eat our lunch inside of this tower because there's real lions out here. This is like on a real safari in, in the Serengeti, as natural as it gets. There's lions, there are hyenas, there's baboons, lots of wild animals, and they can kill you. So we eat in the pavilion. Well, there are a bunch of, uh, and they said, no, that's okay. We're going to eat outside. So what happens? We hear this commotion. And what had happened is as soon as they set up their table and went to get a little bit more stuff, baboons just descended on their table and took all the food and ran away with it. They started to chase the baboons. The baboons literally stopped and started throwing rocks. <laughs> they picked their rocks. Just, I'll tell you no lie. It was the most hilarious thing in the world. Wow. <laughs> I've never seen anything like it at that before then or since that time. It was hilarious. And But the point was, the person told us to stay inside where you have protection. That's what we're talking about is you can go through the valley of the shadow of death, this life, but God is our protector, right? So I'm going to prepare a table right in front of your enemies. Sit down, eat at peace, because I am with you. I am your protector. So that's what that's talking about. And then the purpose, you anoint my head with oil. So anointing the head with oil is very significant because it shows favor. And it shows that there's a purpose for you. I have a higher purpose for you. Your head has been anointed because there's a special purpose for you in life. So understand our special purpose right now is to be saved so that we can teach salvation to other people, say how good God is all of the time, even when we're walking through the valley of shadow of death. Our purpose is to become God beings so that we can assist God in helping other people to become God beings. And provision is the third one, my cup overflows. And then praise is the fourth one. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever and ever, amen, hallelujah. <laughs> so we're gonna really breeze through these. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Um, I'm even gonna skip this part because that's a lot. I'm gonna go right to this one. So at the table of the good shepherd, this is something, the backstory to this is Saul did a lot of wrong against David, but Jonathan treated David very well. So David made a pledge that if anything ever happens to you, I will take care of your descendants. So Meshibosheth is one of Jonathan's uh, descendants. So 2 Samuel chapter 9, verses 6 through 7. Now David is on the throne. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and showed respect. And David queried, Meshibosheth, is this you? And he answered, Behold, your servant. Yes, I am. And David said to him, Don't be afraid, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father. You will eat bread at my table continually. And that's what our father is saying to us. Again, this is David saying it to Meshibosheth. This is Yahweh, Yeshua saying it to us. You will eat bread at my table continually because David slaughtered most of his enemies. 
I think just about all of his enemies and anything that he, anyone he didn't slaughter, Saul did. I mean, Solomon did, but I think David took care of all of his enemies. And so Meshivasheth was fearful, am I next? But David's like, nope, I remember the covenant that I have. God has a covenant with us. And he says, you can eat bread at my table continuously. <laughs> so that's the power of God. You anoint my head with oil. Two offices are filled with, by the anointing of the head. Yeshua and the saints fulfill both offices. The first office is that of a priest. And in Leviticus 8, chapter 10 through 12, Leviticus chapter 8, verses 10 through 12, says Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and everything in it, thus sanctifying them. He sprinkled the oil on the altar seven times and anointed the altar and all his vessels and the basins and the base to sanctify them. And he poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to sanctify him. So we have been anointed to be priests. All right, that's one. And also to be king. Our destination is to also be kings in the world tomorrow. And so in 2 Kings chapter 9, verses 1 through 10, 2 Kings chapter 9, verses 1 through 10, this is Elisha, not Elijah, but Elisha, the prophet, called one of the sons of the prophets and said to him, find Jehu and take this vial of oil and pour it on his head and say, Yahweh says, I have anointed you king over Israel. So let's pass by that. So both priest and king, Yeshua fills both as Melchizedek, and that's why that's the priesthood. And we also, because we belong to Melchizedek priesthood as well, we will fulfill the priest and the king. Now, I have a lot of verses down. <laughs> we obviously won't do that. My cup runneth over. So this is Psalm chapter 16, verses 1 through 11. This is talking about provision. The last one was about purpose. And the first one, you lay the table in front of my enemies about power. So now it's about provision. And this is Psalm chapter 16, verses 1 through 11. Psalm chapter 16, verses 1 through 11. Keep me safe, O El, for in you I have found shelter. I said to Yahweh, you are my Adonai. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints who are in the land, they are noble. In them is all my delight. As for those who run after another Elohim, lowercase e, my May their sorrows multiply. I will not pour out their drink offerings of blood nor lift up their names with my lips. Yahweh is my portion and my cup. So you see how it says beforehand, I'm not going to pour out their drink offerings of blood nor lift up their names because their cups were filled too, but is filled with praise to false gods. So she's saying, I have my cup that's filled and it runs over, but I'm going to pour out my cup to the one true God. So Yahweh is my portion and my cup. So when it says my cup runs over, it's not just talking about our physical blessings. It's talking most importantly about spiritual blessings. And the greatest spiritual blessing is to have Yahweh or Yeshua. So you cast my lot, my boundary lines fall in pleasant places. Surely my heritage is beautiful. I will bless Yahweh who counsels me even at Night, my heart instructs me. Verse eight, I have set Yahweh always before me. Since he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken, though I go through the valley of the shadow of death. Um, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Verse nine, so my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body also rests secure. Verse 10, for you won't abandon my soul to shale, nor let your faithful one see the pit. You're not gonna let me die in this valley of death, you're going to bring me through the valley of the shadow of death. Verse 11, you make known to me the path of life, though I walk through, through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because I know the end result is I'm going to walk through the valley and I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. So you make known to me the path of life. Abundance of joys are in your presence and eternal pleasures at your right hand. <laughs> and then the last one, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
God's favor chases me down everywhere I go. Picture of a beautiful queen there on the left. And then the right is a picture of us being married to Yeshua. Yeshua welcoming us into eternal life, dwelling with him. And he is our husband. We are his wife forever. So to end it up, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 through 11. And Mr. McGarity, are you still on the line? You might have had, yeah, I know he has to go about three o'clock or even before then for the other service. And plus you have crappy internet service, so it might be down right now. But anyway, this is one of his favorite um, passages of scripture. Second Peter chapter one, verses two to 11. May grace and shalom be multiplied to you in the knowledge of Elohim and of Yeshua, our Lord, their divine, divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Do we hear that? Everything we need for life, life abundantly and life eternally, for godliness right now, through the knowledge of him, not through the knowledge of some other shepherd, but through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and virtue, through these things, he has given us his precious and magnificent promises so that through them, you may become partakers of the divine nature. We're being transformed from human nature to divine nature. So it's natural for us to do divine things. Since you have escaped the corruption that evil desires have brought into this world. Now, for this very reason, make every effort, add to your faith virtue, to your virtue knowledge, and God willing, next year, I'm going to have a series of sermons on all of these. I've already completed them. So if I'm alive, I'm healthy. If there's anybody here to listen to it, <laughs> then I'll give the sermon. Because um, it's interesting to break down all of these. And he says, to knowledge and to knowledge, uh, self-control, add to self-control, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly love, and to brotherly love, love, agape love. Now, this is the part that I like. All of that is important. We're re really getting to this part. For if these qualities are in you and are increasing, which means this is what we need to be focusing on. That's why this passage of scripture is so important for us. It's like a prescription of getting us through the valley of the shadow of death. So if you are walking through the valley of the shadow of death, developing these qualities as you go, and they're increasing, they will keep you from becoming idle and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah. It'll keep you from being like Job for a while. It'll keep you from being like the Israelites and it'll help you to become like David. But anyone who lacks these qualities is blind, nearsighted because they've forgotten their cleansing from past sins. Therefore, brothers and sisters, Make all the more effort to make your calling and election certain. For if you keep doing these things, you will never fall. Verse 11, I guarantee that in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, the Messiah Yeshua, will be abundantly provided to you. I am leading you through the valley of the shadow of death. I am leading you into my house where you will dwell forever and ever. And I'm talking about busting the doors open wide, not where you have to stand at the door and knock and knock and knock and try to kick it in. And, and somebody kind of opens it up just a little bit to peek to see. No, it's like they can see you from miles. The red carpet is out there. The trumpets are blazing. There's a party. The angels are celebrating the 24 living creatures. 24 elders and four living creatures. Yeah. <laughs> They're all like waiting for you to come. They can't wait for you to come. There's a big celebration. That's what we're talking about. Abundantly provided to you. A great celebration for each and every one of us to come into the kingdom of God. You talk about a wedding that's going to be glorious, fantastic. If we spent all, if we calculate all the money that we've all spent on our weddings, or that Daniel's yet to spend on his wedding. <laughs> It'll be nothing compared to what our father is going to spend on his son and his future daughter-in-law. You know, <laughs> that will be phenomenal. So that is the message.
just remember, if you can, I know we're bombarded, not bombarded, because a lot we choose to listen to. So we have a lot of information coming at us during the week. We try to stay on the same subject, so at least a little bit can sink in. So last week we said, talk about your shepherd. And this week we said, talk to your shepherd. As you're going through the valley of the shadow of death, talk to your shepherd. I will fear no evil because you are with me and you are good all of the time. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I understand that my cup overflows. I understand that you've made a table in the midst of my enemies because you're so powerful. And surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I'm going to dwell in your house forever. So thank you, my good shepherd. I know who you are and therefore I trust you and I love you, and I give myself wholly to you, and I will praise you to talk about you as I talk to you all the days of my life. So thank you all for listening to